resource verification. Um, my name is Henrietta Wilson. I'm absolutely delighted to be part of this. I conduct freelance um, research on weapons regulation and it's really exciting to be part of the SOAS team um, looking at this really interesting project. Um, thank you all very much for coming here and welcome to everybody. We've got a lot of really exciting speakers and a lot of very exciting participants. Um, before I hand over to the speakers, I'm just going to say a very few words about how these webinars are going to work and uh, what they're about. <laughs> so first of all, they've got a dual purpose. Um, the main uh, inspiration for running these types of webinars is simply to showcase the variety of open source verification that is happening right now all around the world. Um, so by open source verification, what we mean are systems for tracking illicit activities that rely on publicly available information and are done by non-governmental groups and individuals. So we're aware that technologies have absolutely transformed the capacity for looking at things remotely, identifying things that are going on, and also for communicating about those things. So we can see this in activities designed to uh, observe nuclear proliferation, small arms flows, movements of illegal radioactive materials, um, all sorts of tracking systems are happening in very different ways. Um, so we want these webinars to really explore that uh, diversity um, of what's going on. Um, but beyond that, we want the webinars to provide a space to really consider some wider issues associated with open source verification. So as different as all of these activities are, there are some commonalities uh, going on around them. Um, in particular, there are some challenges. Uh, some of the activities encounter very similar ethical dilemmas, dilemmas. Some of them have issues around authenticating the data that they generate from the open sources. Um, and there are also some commonalities in thinking about the wider political significance of open source verification. Um, so sent, uh, question marks around how much open source activities can contribute to bigger sort of, uh, uh, regulations against weapon systems and that's particularly interesting to two uh, projects at SOAS. First of all the scrap weapons uh, project which is looking at options for general and complete disarmament and relatedly uh, SOAS is looking at uh, the possibilities, the desirability of a global weapons tracking system um, and in that mind, we're thinking about could open source verification afford a seed, an inspiration for a global system to track we weapons? Would that be helpful to other global regulation systems? Is it helpful to have more diversity? So these webinars are really an opportunity to explore those sorts of questions. Um, so what we're going to do today is we're going to have four short talks from people engaged in very different sorts of open source verification activities. And then we're going to have a comment um, from a respondent who will reflect on the talks we've had. Throughout the uh, webinar, we'd be really happy to have questions um, from all the participants and you could submit those um, through the chat function. Um, if possible, it'd be great if you could also give your name and affiliation. You can start asking questions or making comments right now. Um, the webinar will be recorded uh, and transcribed and published uh, via the SOAS website uh, after the event. Um, and just to say, we're set to finish this uh, webinar at 3 p.m. Um, but we are going to keep the Zoom um, function open uh, for another half an hour after that for anybody who wants to stay on for some informal discussions around the event. Um, so just to give you a sense of the running order, I'm delighted to introduce some really fantastic speakers. I'm really grateful and also their time uh, in contributing to this. First of all, we'll have James Revel, who's a researcher on the WMD programme at Unidea. And he's going to be followed by Veronica Bedenko, who's an analyst at the Open Nuclear Network and Deteo. Um, Andrea Carboni is a senior researcher at ACLID and a research associate at the University of Sussex. And Grant Christopher, a senior researcher at Vertic, will be the final speaker. Also from Vertic, we've got Anurada Darmale, who's going to reflect um, and respond uh, to the speakers. Um, so thank you very, very much for everybody, and I'll hand over straight away to James Rebel. Thank you.
Okay, hopefully I can get this working. Uh, <clears throat> okay, and now I started the wrong part. Okay, um, can I check, can people hear me, first of all? Yep, okay, and I'm hoping you can see the slides um, as, as I go through. Uh, first of all, thanks to, Henrietta, uh, thanks to Henrietta and the organizers more generally for the opportunity to speak in this exciting series. I should note, I am speaking in my personal capacity, so these views do not necessarily reflect those of UNIDIR or the UN. And I should also note that um, what I'm going to talk about draws from a series of papers that we are developing um, through a Norwegian funded project on WND compliance and enforcement. And we have some more papers to come, which will focus more on open source verification and open source tools. And in terms of what I'm going to talk about, if this still works, yep, okay. <clears throat> um, I, I want to start off with a bit of an outline of some of the potential roles that open source information can play in addressing uh, WND, WND treaty compliance concerns. But I also want to look at some of the users of different sources of the open source. I think asking this question of who and how different entities will use open source can actually be quite helpful. And finally, I want to sort of conclude with a healthy dose of realism. I don't really want to poop the party, but I think it is important to recognize that there will be challenges in trying to use this technology. So to start with concerning some of the roles of open source, I think there are, there are multiple ways this can feed into treaty compliance. First one, I think, is providing alerts of possible non-compliance. Alerts of incidents such as disease outbreaks or alleged chemical weapons use will in some cases become first visible through open source data. To give you an example, uh, ProMed is the first to report natural disease outbreaks, including SARS, MERS, Ebola, and the early spread of Zika. In cases where there was a deliberate outbreak of disease caused by a biological weapon, it will be likely that tools such as ProMed will be amongst the first to report that event, or at least a suspicious outbreak of disease as it will be understood at that point. Similarly, in looking at chemical weapons issues as well, it was YouTube videos that, and social media materials which provided the first indication of a chemical weapons attack in Ghouta in August 2013. So there are two sort of functions there. In addition, open source trade data can also be very useful in identifying anomalies with imports and exports. And open source satellite data can provide a number of functions, which I think Veronica and others will talk to further later on. The second area that I think to look at is the role of open source in contributing to investigations of non-compliance. And here it is clear, particularly in the work of the OPCW, that open source has become useful. So the IIT first report indicated that they collected information from open sources. For example, flight data was confirmed through open sources. Similarly, in the OPCW fact-finding missions, they also drew in part from open source information that was cross-checked with other data. <clears throat> There's also a third possible role which I think open source can play in relation to WMD treaties, is that of contributing to accountability. So open source information, once corroborated and authenticated, can serve as evidence to hold actors to account. You can see one example of this in the International Impartial Independent Mechanism, which is using open sources amongst a number of other evidentiary tools to investigate and prosecute um, those responsible for serious crimes under international law. So there are these various different functions. I should point out the latter one. So talking about contribution to accountability is not the same as treaty verification, which I'll come back to shortly. In terms of who's going to be using these sources, I think you can identify three categories loosely. If you can begin to look at the end user requirements, it can perhaps be useful in trying to target and develop data suitably. So if you take the case of NGOs, civil society, academia, these bodies are typically able to innovate quicker with open source technologies. They can produce assessments faster and they can be more forthright in what they say. However, there are questions and questions have in the past arisen about the impartiality of NGOs. I think there are also limits to the extent to which NGO actors and civil society can feed into discussions around compliance. There's very often gonna be a, a sort of case of one way traffic with information going in. International organizations can also use open source, but they have to use it in a different fashion. So they have to be very careful in what they say and indeed in the methods that they use. There is an expectation that international organizations will produce authoritative outputs based on technical assessments. 
this can be quite a slow process. It's not the case of an hour long CSI episode where it's all over in the space of 60 minutes. It requires authentication, corroboration, um, and it's open source data needs to be validated along with the methods. And finally, for states, there's also clear usage of open source. It provides a valuable alternative to classified sources that can be useful in making points. And indeed, in looking at treaty compliance, states will draw on all available evidence they have to reach a judgment around treaty compliance. This is important because it's essentially going to be states that enforce treaties, certainly in the case of major treaty violations. These, so the last two, so international organizations and states seem particularly important as they will normally be responsible for verification per se, and there'll be a division of labor between the roles that they play. With this in mind, I turn to my final slide on this idea of a healthy dose of realism. And I do feel slightly bad about being a bit of a party pooper in the first session of the first, um, first event here, but I do think it's important when you're thinking about open source verification particularly in relation to treaties, this can be very useful. Particularly as we face a, a current uh, situation in which we have a highly contested information environment and we're facing considerable geostrategic tension. So a couple of things to keep in mind. First is that open source is seen unfavorably by some states who in the past have challenged both the authenticity and the basis of open source uh, data. Such we need to be careful that open source information can be authenticated. This is going to be even more important as deep fake images become more effective and efficient, making that authenticity, authenticating document is going to be really important. And that may require drawing on a wide range of skills, for example, in the area of digital forensics. It's also important to make sure that open source verification tools are going to be corroborated with other information. Often the sort of technologies we're discussing can provide one single piece of what is a larger picture which is required to address compliance with treaties. So we need to look at how open source, any particular piece of open source data fits with a wider range of wider bits of information. The third portion, I think this is particularly important for international organizations and treaty secretariats, <clears throat> is that both the technology and the methods used will need to be validated. <clears throat> This, in some ways, armor plates or provides a shield against criticism of procedural technical criticisms around procedural or technical integrity. So having clear agreed methods as to how these tools will be used can in some ways protect um, the use of open source. The fourth point relates to information management. In 2019, the IAEA Director General indicated that the agency was handling 140 million items of open source data every year. This raises the question of how international organizations, particularly treaty secretariat bodies, are going to be able to sift out relevant information, how they're going to be able to collect, assess and preserve a wide range of open source information. That's something that can be quite tricky to do. And I suppose my final point is that technological developments in this area and innovations in this area are, are really kind of exciting and it's proceeding at a rapid rate. So if you are looking for fresh approaches to arms control and disarmament, there seems to be great value in looking for looking at open source tools to see what they can provide. But at the same time, open source is not going to be enough in and of itself uh, to verify treaty compliance. It can complement and it can augment existing practices, but it's not going to be a substitute, particularly in, in what is a, a, an increasingly contested information environment. There will be limits to what it can do. So I'll finish my sort of short remarks there. Um, I'm happy to take questions. And as I say, we have a series of papers and another six papers are coming out. If people are interested in this topic um, and want further information on what we're doing, I'm happy to send people an email update. And um, thank you for your time. James, thank you. What an amazing introduction to the uh, sense of the possibilities uh, that open source verification can afford, but also a real sense of some of the difficulties that it might face if it tries to engage with bigger political processes. Um, uh, I'm really interested to find out more about uh, these sorts of areas um, and I would like, I'd be interested to hear your thoughts um, about the extent to which some of these technological solutions might uh, provide opportunities to bypass some of the geopolitical problems um, you referred to. So I recognise completely 
um, that there are limitations that come with open source, particularly around validating uh, the information that's generated. But it also seems to me that uh, verification um, uh, conversations in the past um, often got stuck in negotiations around what was politically uh, acceptable to all contributing states, parties. But now that so much can be seen by non-states, non-governmental uh, groups, does that circumvent those conversations in any sense, do you think? Um, sorry, could you repeat the question? Sorry, I was just thinking, it's just a speculative um, question. Um, so I've been thinking, um, I've, and I've noticed we've got a question from Chen to you about uh, verifying the BWC. Um, is it poss possible and necessary after COVID-19? Um, or is there some minimum verification that would be agreed upon at the ninth review conference of the BWC? Um, you can save these questions if you want to. You can jot them down, you can read the, the group chat. The thing that I was asking you about was, um, mindful of uh, uh, the fact that verification regimes in the past were dependent on what could be agreed politically by states, does open source verification afford opportunities that those sorts of stuck conversation are bypassed simply because so much stuff is more visible than it was before? Um, but yeah. Hmm. I, I think there's certainly potential to do that. I think though, for, for the same reasons that the current difficulties that we're facing at the moment in terms of the wider geostrategic context, I, I think getting acceptance around those tools may be more difficult now than it would have been in the past. So I think there's certainly, there's certainly technological potential to do that. But realising that potential will, over, will require overcoming sort of political ceilings in order for these technologies to be accepted, which is, it is perhaps becoming more difficult now. I, I, right. If I may respond to the BWC question later. Uh, I, of I course, thank you very much. Thanks, James. So I'm going to pass um, the opportunity to talk now to Veronica Badenko. Uh, thank you very much, Veronica. Thank you, Henrietta. Um, just unmuted myself and let me start sharing the screen. Okay, did it work? Does anyone see the screen? Good. Okay, so today I would be talking about open source data analysis for nuclear risk reduction and basically presenting my organization's open nuclear networks concept for nuclear risk reduction and how open source data analysis fits into it. So just to give you Okay, just to give you a bit of a background of what uh, Open Nuclear Network is. So this is an organization that was established back in 2019 in Vienna, Austria. And ONN is a program that is being privately funded by a philanthropic One Earth Future Foundation being headquartered in the United States. And um, ONN's financial and programmatic independence allows us uh, at least to try to remain non-aligned and politically neutral, uh, to reference uh, James' concerns that he raised in his talk. Um, ONN's approach to nuclear risk reductions consists of two core elements. Uh, the synergy which makes ONN concepts specifically powerful, as we believe. So the first element is open source data analysis. Uh, decision makers in states engaged in conflicts that could give rise to the use of nuclear weapons need access to high quality shareable information that enables them to make the best decisions in the face of uh, conflicts. So our team of analysts uh, produce operational insights using unclassified sources and leveraging publicly available data and technology. The second and equally important part uh, of the concept is the engagement uh, network. Uh, this is a concept uh, to engage uh, decision makers through a network of a trusted intermediary, intermediaries, I'm sorry, that we call engagement network. The members of the network are uh, mostly former senior civilian or military government officials, or prominent academics and other experienced and well-regarded practitioners from the field. So with the help of the engagement network, ONN um, hopes to transmit its analysis to top government levels. Um, ONN's overarching goal is the reduction of the risk of nuclear weapons, as I mentioned, and um, 
those nuclear weapons we are concerned might be used in response to error, uncertainty, or misdirection, particularly in the context of escalating conflict. Asymmetric access to information when adversaries lack shared, timely, and reliable information is one of the most important risk factors. While intelligence services exist precisely to minimize those asymmetries and shortfalls, uh, they do so for their respective governments. And sometimes sources and methods have to be protected and information cannot be freely shared. In a standoff relationship, adversaries may be incentivized to not be fully transparent about their intentions and capabilities or present them ambiguously. So such uncertainties and misunderstandings are critical risk factors for conflict escalation. And with the increasing public uh, availability of data from unclassified sources and uh, rapidly advancing analytical capabilities, we believe that civil society can and should provide alternative sources for trustworthy information and analysis. NGOs could provide independent assessment of capabilities of the parties to a conflict. And this could contribute to alleviating the core challenge of asymmetric information. NGOs could also offer independent verification complementary to the one conducted by states or perform fact checking to help clarify allegations or disputed incidents. This could be achieved without having to create bilateral or multilateral institutions or mechanisms, which would definitely save us time in the times of conflict. For both of the mentioned activities, verification and fact checking, Open source capabilities are especially instrumental, as the process through which a specific assessment has been made can be reviewed and confirmed. Commercial available satellite imagery allows NGOs to continuously monitor activities around the globe and check those changes. For example, like movements and troops, military vehicles and large equipment, renovation and upgrading of sites, uh, those could all be now observed uh, through the rapidly developing and commercially available remote sensing capabilities. While governments, of course, could uh, initially be uncomfortable with uh, such third party involvement, uh, a proven record of neutral assessments can increase confidence in the added value of neutral non-governmental entities. So one of the key tools that um, my organization and analysis, analysts in our organization use in their work is the open source data platform that we call the TEO. This platform is designed to specifically, was designed specifically by ONN to facilitate a more efficient way of data processing. So the TEO brings together diverse types of data such as text, images, video, satellite imagery, aircraft and marine uh, vessel tracking data and all other types on one platform. And by combining all those data sets, the platform empowers the users with a more comprehensive basis for the analysis. Um, another essential characteristic and probably the one that is most important uh, is the accessibility of detail for the general public. So we encourage individuals to, uh, who are interested in open source data analysis to join the platform and contribute to professional conversations. The TAIO allows vetted users to interact with each other and discuss any of data available on the platform. So through those conversations, um, it, would, uh, it would allow us for a constant peer reviewing of one's analysis, thus increasing the quality and uh, making one's analysis less bias. So with that, uh, I would probably stop here. And uh, if you have any questions and comments or any points for discussion, I would be happy to address those. Thank you so much. Um, thank you, Veronica. Wow, uh, an amazing uh, insight into um, an, a project that's really operationalizing some of the things that James uh, mentioned. Uh, it's really interesting to hear about this model that you've got for crowdsourcing people to come and help authenticate the data that you generate. So it'll be interesting uh, maybe to get, have a conversation with James about how that could work in the wider uh, conversations he was talking about. Um, I'm interested to put it um, back to you. You say that one of the uh, roles of the Open Nuclear Network is engaging decision makers. And so just a very quick uh, uh, mm -hmm. response about um, how, much, how much appetite is there for that? How much interest is there for that? 
in, in the people you talk to? Right. So uh, just because we're in a new program uh, just established 2019, we're still in the making. So for the first year of our operation, we decided to concentrate on the conflict on the Korean Peninsula. So we're trying to get engagement uh, network members from the six countries that participated in six party talks, namely US, Russia, China, South and North Korea and Japan. Um, currently, you know, COVID kind of um, interfered into our plans. So now it's really difficult to meet people, but we're still trying to stay positive and we think mm -hmm. Um, that would be actually, you know, really interesting for those people to still be part of the conversation and be um, those peacemakers so they, they, they can still make the difference. We think that's really attractive. And so looking forward to that. Um, great. I forgot yeah. to unmute there for a second. <laughs> Thank you very much. Um, I'm going to move on now to Andrea Carboni from ACLED and the University of Sussex. Uh, thank you very much, Andrea. Yep. Hello. Uh, thanks, Henrietta, for organizing the panel for the invite. Um, what I'll try to do, I won't have slides, I'll try to provide um, kind of a general overview of the work we do uh, at ACLED, uh, kind of the authentication and sourcing processes we have in place, uh, so the way we engage with open sources, uh, and show, kind of describe also possible applications of our data and perhaps if I have time also kind of showcasing one example of these uh, application and the combination with other open sources. Um, uh, ACLED is the acronym for uh, Armed Conflict Location Event Data Project, uh, which is uh, at the moment the most comprehensive real-time um, data collection on political violence and protests across the world. Uh, the project started actually as a, an Africa-focused um, initiative and then expanded to also include Asia, uh, Middle East, uh, the Americas. We've just launched two new projects on the United States uh, and East Asia just in the, in the past weeks. And we are about to launch also the, uh, the Western uh, Europe data, which will kind of provide uh, global coverage to, to our project. Um, uh, we work, uh, well, primarily uh, with open sources, meaning, meaning that we rely on uh, secondary, uh, secondary sources like media, uh, media outlets, um, you, like reports from human rights organizations, uh, data provided by um, INGOs, um, I'd say, well, selected Twitter accounts, uh, and some data that are shared kind of privately, so confidentially by uh, local partners in contexts where data collection is particularly difficult because, uh, because of the specific political environment, uh, where, which doesn't allow, for instance, uh, accurate media coverage. Um, this means that we don't uh, kind of verify the specific content, well, the specific, the, the you know, the, uh, we are not collecting the data ourselves. We don't have the, of course, the, the resources nor the, the team to do that, but we rely and we rely on the quality of the sources we use and we verify that the, um, that the sources, again, we, we use are trusted uh, and provide as accurate uh, as possible information. Um, of course, due to the, this is largely due to the real time um, uh, nature of the data collection and the scope and the kind of general scope of the, of the project. So we, we kind of try to work globally and have a full coverage of all states which means rural, urban areas, uh, outside of the, you know, usually Moscow regions as well. Um, but again, because of the real-time nature also of the data collection process, we are aware that there might be issues with, with data collection. This is why we periodically, I'd say, weekly uh, review um, the quality and the content of the data we, we, we provide. Uh, I'd say that approximately 10% of all data uh, we collect each week 
are um, corrections to previous events, simply because sometimes there, there is, um, you know, more information available that wasn't uh, at the time of, um, uh, of, the, uh, of the, the initial release, or simply because the, you know, the information has been, th th there was a lag in the, in the availability of the information. Uh, and again, this is particularly important when there are spikes in uh, protest activity, for instance, in particular contexts, or um, you know, changes in conflict trends that doesn't that don't allow immediate access for journalists, particularly to uh, to to worrying areas. Um, I mean, we can come back also to that with a with a questions later, and if you if you actually know want to know a bit more about the, um, the data collection and the sourcing process, which is a big part of the, you know, the internal reflections we have in our team. Um, I'd say uh, the, the, the data are, of course, used by a number of different actors because of the granularity of the data. We, we are not interested in, you know, aggregation, in, in aggregated conflicts, but actually in providing uh, disaggregating uh, they disaggregated data on conflict events discrete conflict events and we provide information on the specific date location actors that are involved or uh, the number of fatalities um, and, and and some uh, kind of other additional information uh, we don't provide and I, I try to connect here to the you know to the topic of the uh, the webinar one of the topics of the webinar which is actually the weapons uh, how we can track actually weapons. We don't provide that kind of specific uh, granular uh, information, I'd say. Uh, although we provide whenever this is available in news reports, we actually provide as much information as possible and available about the weapons that are used in, in conflict events there. And we, we note that in, uh, in, uh, in the data. Um, however, uh, we've seen that all the kind of uh, partners and uh, organizations that use ACLA data combine these data with other with other sources. Uh, we have, you know, data being used in academia by international organizations or uh, non-governmental organizations as well for planning purposes, for instance, uh, or to see what, uh, you know, uh, what's the outcome of specific measures and uh, policies they've taken. Uh, by governments as well, uh, and by and by journalists, and uh, perhaps I wanted to showcase here an example uh, from from last year, and particularly from, um, uh, from an investigation that was carried out by a group of French journalists uh, that were working on the use of specific French-made weapons in uh, in Yemen in the war in Yemen. Um, so the the investigation. Let me just uh, maybe. Uh, share my screen so you can have a look. Uh, it's called it's called Made in France, and was actually intended to um, uh, to in, in investigate whether um, particularly artillery uh, weapons and tanks were used uh, were used in Yemen for offensive purposes. Uh, something that you know the French government had denied for for long. Uh, but that, according to these journalists, was discredited by some uh, leaked documents that they <clears throat> were able to access. Um, and perhaps I can show here uh, uh, one uh, of these specific applications. So let me see. The website is a bit uh, is a bit heavy. Um, yeah, here you go. So we've got these maps. So this was one of the leaked documents at the time, which showed that in some areas of uh, of um, along the border between Saudi Arabia and Yemen, um, Hovi, uh, I think it was like uh, Hovitzer cannons were stationed uh, by Saudi Arabian forces um, and claimed for um, claimed to be for defensive purposes. Um, the, these cannons were actually uh, French made and the, and the, and the French uh, Minister of Defense had claimed and denied that they were used for offensive purposes or they were used in combat operations. What happened was that these journalists uh, uh, actually contacted us and uh, uh, particularly asked whether along these areas that are 
within the range of, uh, of the cannons, there were any events in which artillery had targeted uh, civilian areas, particularly civilian areas. Um, because that would, if not proved, because of course it's very difficult to, to, to prove that, uh, but to, to pr provide substantial evidence uh, that those weapons had been uh, involved in, in such offensive operations and particularly targeting uh, civilian areas. What we did uh, was actually provide such data uh, there was also combined with satellite imagery as well, so kind of additional layer of open sources being used here. What we provide was uh, these, uh, these, uh, these data, uh, I can also show some more, but uh, these data in which um, at least, uh, we identify at least 30, 35 civilians were killed in 52 different bombardments that were located in areas in which these Caesar cannons, so um, Horowitz type, uh, were stationed. Uh, and the same was also done for other uh, weapon systems, so Leclerc tanks, uh, particularly along the coast at this time, so uh, in, in these uh, in, in these area of Yemen, so here along the coast. Um, so this is to sum up and I'll just come to conclude here. So I'll stop, uh, uh, sorry, I forgot how to, yeah, stop, sure. Um, so this was just a, you know, one of the examples in which ACLA data, uh, well, not only relied in this case on open sources, but also contributed to kind of large scale open source based investigations that combine multiple uh, multiple, you know, uh, sources. So satellite imagery, uh, uh, the use of conflict data, uh, and um, and also the presence of, you know, the knowing where some weapons are uh, are used as station in particular. So I'll stop here, and perhaps we can uh, also talk more later uh, about other applications or uh, sourcing or whatever question. Thank you very much. Um, uh, wow, what an amazing, another really amazing set of insights about the scope of what comes under the banner of open source verification and what can be achieved. And as James introduced right at the start, this sense that uh, there are issues around authenticating what you do. But as Veronica and Andrea both pointed out, embedded in, your, in both your models in quite different ways, there's a sense that you filter out what you're getting. You're, you yourself are authenticating the data as, as it goes to, to make sure it's as reliable as possible and you respond to suggested corrections. So uh, I'm going to move us on to Grant now, but I think there's options for a really interesting conversation about t knitting those all together with, with, the, with the bar that James set us <laughs> to start with. Um, so thank you very much. Here's Grant Christopher uh, with his talk. Thank you. Hello everyone, sorry I just wanted to get everything set up before I started talking. Um, so we're going back to nuclear, so uh, really uh, tying in with Veronica and I think it'll touch on quite a few of the things that Jamie was talking about. Uh, but you know, unlike Jamie that really had to think about the problem of the use of chemical and biological weapons in attribution, um, we're not perhaps thinking about attributing the use of nuclear weapons but more about how many weapons do people have? What's the status of people's nuclear infrastructure? Um, so if no one's really uh, offered definitions, we kind of skip that stage and I'm certainly not a definitions guy, um, but what is open sources and what is open source intelligence? It's roughly the internet, broadcast media, um, so TV, radio, et cetera, and print media, so books, journals, magazines, and then everything kind of gets thrown into the internet, so social media and satellite imagery, which always traditionally has been a completely separate intelligence division. And, uh, you know, a lot of, uh, there are people that used to be former satellite imagery specialists that have now kind of moved into uh, open source satellite, satellite imagery work. So I want to again with uh, you know, Jamie's last slide, talk about the limits of open source before we start talking about how it's used. So 
it, it's pretty hard. Um, it's hard to kind of get what you want because there's often a scarcity of good sources. Um, maybe you want to find information and answer a question and then you realize there just isn't information available. No matter how good your team is, no matter how good your, uh, your uh, information management infrastructure is. But if you have several small pieces of information and you have a skilled team, you can go very, very, very far and, and answer some really interesting questions. Um, it can be effective. It, it, you can often work really, really fast. You know, NGOs and, and uh, small, small teams can move very fast. Um, but often analyses will take a few years before they're ready to be made public. But, you know, as people have said, you can openly share these. This is a way for um, parties that don't really want to talk about national technical means, so spies and satellites and, and such, um, to talk about what another country is doing without revealing sources. But really importantly, it's just a component um, when talking about verification regimes. So verification has been used in two different ways in this talk by everyone. So just if you talk to OSINT people, verification means, is this thing that we found, does it actually show what it really is showing? That's what verification means here. And then we're also talking about um, an international agreement where you're trying to verify that each party is doing what they say they're doing under the agreement. And that's what I will uh, talk about when I talk about verification here. And you cannot use OSINT alone to constitute a verification regime. You must have some other elements to your regime to do it. Uh, so I come from Vertic. Uh, Vertic is really, first and foremost, a, a technical um, verification organization. So we help um, organizations build and improve their, their verification regimes. That's basically the, the rhythm nature of Vertic. Um, I want to talk about a, a very exciting recent case study I had the privilege of being involved with. Um, so this this is really done by Dave Smiller. Um, he works for the Center for Non-Proliferation Studies, uh, and this work is also in partnership with Royal United Services Institute, RUSI. And we're looking at North Korea from open sources. And, and Dave just published this analysis of a, a re-evaluation of uh, North Korea's only known uh, uranium yellow cake production facility. Um, so the nuclear fuel cycle, as many of you know, um, you've got to get uh, stuff all the way from mining it in the ground to your weapons testing facilities and, and metallurgy factories. And you've got to make some fissile materials, so stuff you can put in bombs. So there are going to be quite a few facilities in every country doing this. And the real goal is figuring out what's going on at these facilities, what research is going on, but also what materials going in and out and you know clearly the the main product of this analysis is this large picture but there are really important other sources of information that go into this analysis that you know have have leaked into the open source or moved into the open domain but they include on the ground inspections so north korea has been on and off about letting inspectors in and there's footage from one inspection that revealed really important technical information about how this facility processes, it, processes the uranium that was a really important part of the investigation. Um, there were diplomatic cables from in the Cold War that, that give us a clue about you know, how concentrated the, the uranium is that it is being mined out of the ground. Um, there are some important technical papers just in general about the process that is going on at this kind of facility, but also specific to what North Korea is doing. Um, so the big takeaway is satellite imagery, you know, with this, this was titled, uh, you know, in the age of Google Earth, so with a satellite imagery focus, this is dependent on what other sources are available. And, you know, you really need to be able to do on the ground inspections and install technical equipment to to have a, an appropriate and competent verification regime for assessing a nuclear program. I've gone the wrong way. Apologies. Um, so I just want to conclude on this. Um, so this is another uh, you know, brief case study. This again comes from uh, CNS really, but just talking about how OSINT can respond to the news cycle and what its role is. So uh, the picture on the right 
the top right is from the negotiations of the Iran deal, the JCPOA. And right up to when this, this uh, deal was concluded, you know, this ha had significant political domestic opposition in the United States and in other countries. And this has been done before. This isn't the first instance and it won't be the last. But some people weren't happy with the status of the negotiations and that something was going to be concluded. Um, so a, Iran had a history of concealing enrichment facilities, you know, the most sensitive, the most, the most, uh, one of the most important parts of the fuel cycle where you get uranium, you could put in a bomb. And an organization said, no, they've got another facility um, trying to erode Iran's credibility. Um, so, you know, I got contacted about this and asked about this, but, you know, thankfully the CNS team, had, Jeffrey Lewis had already published um, a, a refutation of this on the arms control Wonk blog. And uh, uh, people associated with this, yes, and Melissa was involved with this too. Um, and they you know, that this idea that the truth can, you know, has to get get its shoes on while the light is traveling around the world. Well, this this refutation was so fast that the damage was really limited here. And I think that's a, a really important thing to think about that Ozin can be rapid. Um, and there is a bit of an asymmetry that it's often a little easier to refute something with Ozin than it is to prove something. Um, so that is, that is a very particular challenge associated with Ozin as well. But I would just like to uh, leave it there with that thought. Thank you. Um, thank you very much, uh, Grant. Uh, so much to think about there. Um, we've had a question um, from Julia Al. Thank you very much. Um, that I'm going to put straight to you, but anybody else who wants to think about it as well, uh, it would be interesting to hear your reflections. She, she's asking about what... Uh, what specifically are the uses of open source verification? And, I, and I'm very interested to hear Grant's <laughs> response to that, given that you're so categorical that it can't replace a formal verification regime attached to a treaty, which I think echoes the comments that James started us off with uh, straight away. Um, and I absolutely appreciate what you're saying, um, but it also feels to me, you, you mentioned one of the tasks of conventional verification regimes is to build confidence in uh, compliance. Um, well, it, it's very hard <laughs> for a conventional verification regime um, to do that. So the fact that it's also very hard for open source schemes to do that doesn't seem to me to necessarily uh, rule it out. I, I don't know. I'm kind of thinking off the top of my head. And the secondly, uh, uh, Julia mentioned, what do, do, you, do you see there's a difference between open source intelligence and open source verification uh, 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 it feels as though there are subtle differences to me, but I'd be interested to hear your thoughts about that. Sorry, I'll unmute. Um, so going back to um, an earlier comment that was made about the, the sensitivities and about how you'd actually get these things included in a, a BW, CW re regime. Um, so one of the reasons open source intelligence uh, is, is used, that's what the kind of the practitioner community uses, but uh, politically it's easier to just talk about open sources. That, that's, that's pretty much it, um, from my understanding. So I have never had um, access to classified information, so I can't give a complete answer about how in an all source uh, intelligence question what role open source does but I have spoken to many people that have tried to do these things and uh, you know hopefully my what I presented kind of gives a little more on on Julia's question so Julia posted it before my talk I know but when you have all sources then open source is a component and when you have only open sources then you have to you have to rely on leaks and, and other such things. I think that's the way it goes. Um, there's some other really interesting discussions about, um, I think there have been questions of culture in organizations that actually have to do and answer these kind of questions that secret intelligence and intelligence uh, obtained over certain means was always seen as more valuable, even if you could get a much simpler answer or, or, or better answer or different answer from open sources. Um, so the, the secret versus the, the easy to obtain um, shouldn't necessarily be worse or better 
uh, information uh, and should be evaluated carefully. Um, uh, I don't think I can really answer that question fully though, but I hope that, that gives a little No, that's, really, that's little. really helpful. Yeah, thank you very much. Um, I'm going to hand over to Anurada Damale, please, uh, for your reflections uh, on these four fabulous talks. Uh, thank you very much. Um, so I'm Annie. Thank you so much for the introduction, uh, Henrietta, and thank you to SOAS for organising what's been a really interesting event. Um, thanks to Jamie, Veronica, Andrea and Grant for your presentations as well. Um, I'm going to quickly provide some reflections from what I've scribbled down during all of these talks. Um, hopefully the things I say will encourage a bit more discussion and a few more questions from the audience. So I work largely in a CBRN um, space, so that's chemical, biological, nuclear and radiological, swapped over, sorry, um, when it comes to verification. So it was really interesting to hear contributions both within and outside of you know the specific topics. Um, when thinking about the topic of the webinar, the first two or three things that came to me um, to be interesting things to discuss, which have been touched on uh, to some extent. Uh, the first one was this idea of who will guard the guards. So that's the verification and authentication of methodologies and data surrounding verification and open source data collection. Um, I'm also really interested, and this spills out of CBRN into also space, um, conventional arms, small arms, um, into the ethics surrounding both the power dynamics in, in data collection ownership, um, and also just how that open source information can be used. So this is something that's been talked a lot about my, in my background of science, in, in open science, is the ethics of open source information and how it can be used for good and bad. So what I'm going to do really quickly is summarize some key highlights from each of the talks and then leave it to the questions uh, to the audience because I think there will be more than enough. So uh, James, I'll start with you. Uh, thank you so much for outlining, you know, these three roles of open source that you talked about uh, in the context of the work that you do. Um, and almost commenting on the ontologies of the methodology and data in that they mean different things to different actors. So they mean different things to states, they might mean different things to NGOs. Um, and that that is even more complicated when we operate in such a contested information environment as you described it. Um, you also mentioned which sort of Grant uh, uh, reiterated this idea that open source is not a substitute um, for other tools in compliance, but actually a part of the a part of the puzzle almost a part of um, this whole system of moving parts that is used to uh, verify compliance or to judge the act uh, judge the behaviors of different actors in the global setting. So I think it was a really good a really good talk to uh, to sort of start us off and talk about verification its its uses and its caveats um, from quite a realist lens as well. Um, and then moving on to Veronica, you know, I've heard so much about Detoyo and the work that Open Nuclear Network do. So it was really interesting to finally see, um, I know that you've only started quite recently, I think last year, um, is that right? Yeah. Um, so it's, it's really great to see um, how you've, you're directly addressing the power dynamics almost that I was talking about. So this asymmetry of information, um, it's something that needs to be addressed, um, especially when you talk about ethics and the verification of, of information, um, and especially touching on the diversity of the data and how they interact with each other. Um, the sense of built-in accountability, I think is, is really, really interesting. Um, what I'm also quite interested to hear about is the agency when it comes to accountability. So where does the responsibility lie, or does it lie anywhere, or is it as dispersed within the network as the accountability system is itself almost so is that agency also peer-reviewed when you talk about you know who is allowed to make a judgment on whether this data is is good bad reliable inaccurate what um, and then talking about diversity of data i think um andrea learning about ACLED today was amazing um it was really interesting to hear about work outside of CBRN when it comes to verification. Um, so political violence, perhaps more on small arms or conventional weapons. Um, and it was also really interesting to hear about how this is now a global network. So the coverage is almost quite decentralized. Um, it was great to see the data viz work as well that you've done, which is not just the sort of geographic visibility part, but cool to see how all of the different data interfaces and relates to each other and, and how you build an image of a, of a singular data point or a singular event um, coming from all the different types of data that you have um, and also sort of uh, different to the verification work that I've been exposed to in that we we at Vertic, so I'm at Vertic with uh, with Grant Christopher and I've worked within his team 
and um, to hear about how you know our work is very much quite often looking at lots of different data and aggregating it over time for a specific country or a specific issue um, looking at how you have discrete packages almost of data for individual events and how open source information can be used for so many different things um, but there's limitations for each and sort of understanding I'd quite like to understand a bit more perhaps the difference in the methodology surrounding those two different approaches and what the pros and cons of each are and how they fit in to a larger uh, sort of compliance or security regime if you will and then finally um, Grant uh, it was um, a great review of the project <laughs> that Vertica are doing but also I really appreciated you defining what OSINT is because I think a lot of times in this field, you know, we literally have an institute called the Acronym Institute because there are so many acronyms. Um, and I'm a big fan of just trying to make everything a bit more understandable. So thank you so much for um, firstly defining what OSINT was, but secondly, also kind of outlining how difficult working in OSINT can be. It's almost like a puzzle that's in four dimensions, but as long as you have lots of different people working together, it can, it can kind of work. Now, the one thing I was, I, I really took away from your talk Grant was when you mentioned how some of the data initially was protected and then became became open source. Um, so things like ground observations within North Korea, and, and it's really interesting to think about how the nature of data can sometimes be dynamic. Um, so it, it also by that logic, the quality of open source data can be varied and dynamic too. Um, and so I'm quite interested in hearing from you. You know, for instance. The, the quality of a, of a data point can differ by source, but it can also differ over time. So if you have a country, for instance, with a changing administration, perhaps the quality or amount of data that you get from that country changes over time too. So I'm quite interested to hear what, what you would think constitutes good data or how you apply intelligence methods to be discerning enough to understand what a good data point is, what a reliable data point is, or is it always going to be relative to the other data you have? Is it more about how it fits in to the rest of the data? So what sort of judgment call do you have to make when you're doing open source intelligence work? Um, and then also when it comes from sources such as deflectors or countries that have vested interests in a certain issue, how the ethics of that scenario play out. Um, so I'm actually gonna leave it there because I, I scribbled down so many notes. It was really hard to try and provide a short reflection on what's been said, but thank you again um, to all the speakers and thank you Henrietta and the SOAS team for organizing today's event. Thank you, Anu. You've done an amazing job at kind of encapsulating uh, so much of the richness that we've got from the speakers today. I'm very mindful that we're on three minutes to three and at three o'clock I said we'd segue uh, to a more informal discussion and some, some people may need to leave at that point, so by all means do leave if you do need to. Um, uh, so I'm going to give each of the speakers a chance to respond to Anu's point but also flag up that, that you've had uh, a couple of other questions through the chat uh, function. Um, one very specifically to Andrea about methodology um, for uh, uh, looking at the, uh, the specific case study you mentioned. Um, and uh, one from uh, Lydia Wilson asking um, about how uh, much dim disinformation affects uh, the challenges of open source verification. So I'm going to go through in the order of the speakers to give you a couple of a minute or two maximum to, to respond. And then if you could stay for a more informal thing, I'll give you a longer chance uh, to respond. So James, you first, please. Okay, thank you, Henrietta. And thank you for all the questions. I'll, I'll try and be as quick as I can. Um, just to point out, Veronica, the comment on impartiality was not directed towards you or ONN, just in case there's any confusion there. Um, if I could address Chen Wei's question, I think that'd be quite important because it was a really good question. Um, there, there are tools that we didn't have last time. There was a serious and significant discussion around BWC verification. One very small example could be online open source trade data. And this is one of a number of tools, including those that Veronica and others have spoken about, which could be adapted. Combined, I think there is potential that these could give us greater confidence in compliance or, or indeed non-compliance, but I don't think it's necessary. I'm slightly hesitant about using the term verification in this regard because that, to use Annie's phrase, there's different ontologies and different meanings there as well. 
But I think this does bring us point to the importance of preparing to have a fresh and a constructive discussion in the run up to the review conference uh, scheduled for late 2021. And I hope there's a, a window of opportunity which states will seize there. Um, if I may, just one other point um, in relation to Lydia's question on disinformation. This, this is not something which is new. This is something which has uh, been around for a long time. It's just it's become faster and spreads more widely, uh, much more swiftly. But I was always struck by a comment from the late Julian Bayer Robinson, it was a paraphrase here because I don't have his eloquence, but um, this idea that allegations of association with chemical and biological weapons have been used by well-intentioned and unscrupulous actors for millennia to vilify enemies. I think that's, it's been around for a long time. It's quite a potent way of getting at people, even if it's not necessarily true. Um, I, I know if I may respond to your comments later and I'll leave it there for others, sorry. Uh, thank you, James. Congratulations. Thank you for <laughs> responding uh, uh, succinctly. Uh, and uh, before I wang on, I will hand over to Veronica, please. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Thank you, Henrietta. So the first point I want to address was about um, using open source for verification. And I want to just be clear because in my speech, I talked about how NGOs would perform verification. And um, I want to make it, you know, crystal clear that we don't talk about substituting state level verification with just the open source, but rather adding this additional level of verification that NGOs could, uh, you know, uh, could uh, offer uh, as an addition to the state level uh, verification. And then to the comment that Anu made about the responsibility, who is responsible for the analysis that we do and I guess the ultimate responsibility still lays with the organization. And um, I guess there is no way uh, to ensure that there will be no mistakes in the analysis that we do. Um, but if we do make a mistake, we would be the first one to acknowledge, yes, we did it and rush right there to, to correct ourselves. But that's when the TAO, uh, we believe, becomes really instrumental because you do put this in the open source and you crowdsource your analysis so you have many, many people to be there and review uh, your stream of thoughts and uh, all the methodology is there to, to, to be open. So we think this is one of the ways to make our analysis as unbiased as possible and you know, limit the number of mistakes that we could do uh, when we're performing that analysis. Yeah, and with that, let me once again thank you, Henrietta, for organizing that. Uh, I don't think I, I touched upon that when I was making my remarks, but that's a really great webinar, and thank you for having all of us. Oops, <laughs> there I was uh, talking. Thank you, Veronica. You know, it's, it's thanks to all of you guys that this is such a rich uh, and interesting conversation. So over to you, Andrea, to respond quickly uh, to, to these uh, questions that we've had, first set of questions. Yeah, I'll try to answer quickly. I mean, the question was very large and perhaps I'll also try to answer uh, uh, Lydia's question about uh, disinformation or in general about uh, how we um, balance, you know, even the kind of the richness sometimes of information. So what we try to do at least is to, uh, well, first of all, triangulate as much, uh, like the information we have, the reports we have as much as possible and as much as, as uh, it's available. Um, for instance, in, in, even in very polarized contexts where there are, you know, warring parties and they may try to spin their own, uh, their own positions, their own uh, figures, for instance, we always uh, try to combine, see what, whether we can find actually uh, more accurate information on either side. If not, we always rely on the most conservative estimate it's possible. Uh, we try not to inflate the scale of the violence, so we report the events, we try to make sure, you know, this is like the, the events we, we uh, we capture are included in our data, but when it comes to, for instance, uh, including the number of fatalities, which in particular contexts, again, can be very politicized, can be used by different sides to push their own uh, propaganda agendas or whatever, we always rely 
on the most um, conservative uh, estimate. This is done consistently across the globe uh, and across uh, regions. Um, again, I've worked primarily on uh, on uh, uh, Yemen in the past few years, and this could be done in areas, for instance, where there was even a lot of coverage, where you know the media environment was rich and you had different positions on the same event. You had different reporting, sometimes you know reporting no fatalities on one other outlet reporting ten fatalities. Let's say we would always rely on. Uh, on on uh, on the most conservative estimate in this case, uh, the problem comes where there are environments where there is only one side reporting. This is the most difficult for us because we have to kind of make a choice in between, you know, reporting the information as it is available, but at the same time we are aware that we are trying to use uh, we are using actually only one side only because that is only uh, that we have available. Um, Northern Yemen is one of those cases where it's very difficult to have a full picture because on one side you have Saudi Arabia, which is a very closed environment and the media reporting is limited sometimes, uh, at least in those kind of warring border areas. Um, and you have the other side, the Yemeni side fighting against Saudi Arabia, which is very keen on actually pushing uh, some, you know, some types of violence over the others. In those cases, what again we try to do is to include uh, the information, and then again, done consistently across all regions we cover, uh, we use uh, kind of standard. For instance, when it came when it comes to fatalities, standard figures, which is usually ten. Um, let's say we know that there has been an unknown number of fatalities or, or injuries and deaths. These are the usual sentences you read we rely on using like a 10, which is kind of an average estimate. We are drawn from Africa, from some specific areas in Africa, wherever we could kind of estimate, uh, you know, that that was an average number in between the fatalities we were missing and the fatalities we were sometimes overestimating. And so that's why we kind of use that. Um, again, and, and I'll close here, uh, what uh, we always stress, particularly when it comes to fatalities, but in general, because they are very political data. I mean, these are can be politicized and they are very politically charged data. Uh, what we always try to, to, to stress is that um, the data uh, and overall, you know, fatality figures are usually estimates, should be treated as estimates that can be more or less accurate but it shouldn't be, you know, we shouldn't be, a, we don't do that, like providing, you know, the very exact number, because that, again, since we can't do like the, ver the first hand verification, uh, working on, on kind of large scale projects, uh, this is what we try to do. So rather than saying, this is the exact figure, uh, try to work on either time trends or estimates. I think this is a bit more productive and accurate to the reality of the process data collection. Uh, thank you, Andrea. Um, a very interesting, uh, it, it feels as though there's different levels going on here, um, that your data can it, is maybe bypassing some of the bigger treaty conversations that James alluded to. We've, we've got a question and Paul Schulter about that. Um, I'm mindful that we're at eight minutes past three, so I'm going to invite Grant to quickly reflect on the questions so far, and then we'll, we'll segue into people being able to make direct uh, comments uh, across the board. Yeah, thank you, Grant. Uh, so I'll go straight into Paul, because I think it's the most interesting and difficult question. And I mean, Paul, Paul knows very well that we shouldn't expect us to be some silver bullet for the most difficult problem in are one of the most difficult problems in arms control, which is compliance disputes, but it can help. And it, it in in the right context where there is good there's good open source information, um, maybe maybe there's a way to help parties resolve disputes by openly sharing without revealing sources and methods uh, for having gotten that information uh, from the first point elsewhere. Um, so perhaps that's a, a way to talk about that. So on Anu's questions on uh, data over time, etc. Um, 
So you can think about some uh, states have become aware of OSINT. So we're in a, a capabilities, counter capabilities regime. Um, you know, they, they know to censor their propaganda and, and change the angles that things are shot and things like that. Um, they know that people monitor their websites. So um, there are, you know, things, you think there used to be a lot of low hanging fruit, um, but now the community and um, the, the, NGOs and the IGOs have, have built up capabilities. So there's, there's, you know, there's additional things we can do, but we're, there's always going to be a capability counter capability battle in terms of, of getting good OSIN and uh, it being concealed. Um, on disinformation. So I gave, I gave a good, uh, pretty good example of, of quite elaborate uh, disinformation. So to do this well, right, it takes probably as much time as it does for good OSINT investigation. At some point, you've got to think about that. So um, maybe maybe we're, we're in a good place where um, the OSINT investigators have the advantage and it's harder at the moment to craft a credible uh, disinformation campaign. Uh, in terms of you know, each individual piece of information that comes through, you know, every a, a good OSINT analyst has a checklist of things that they do that they can go through to try and you know be it a, a, a social media post or a video or a, an article you find, um, and then you can go through technical um, authentication procedures. You know, uh, CNS uses a thing called tungsten to uh, do technical analysis of photography and, and imagery. Um, so you know, there are there are things you can do to be pretty sure that the uh, the thing that you've got is the thing that it says it is, or, or to discard it. Um, so those capabilities do exist and, and they are quite hard to spoof, I think. Um, deep fix, um, you know, we're in a new era where there's gonna be a lot of problems. Um, and, uh, but you know, we're gonna need, um, probably on the, on the political news cycle side, like an army of citizen soldiers, uh, you know, refuting this stuff as it comes in. Uh, on the WMD side, I, I don't know. Thank you. Um, thank you, and uh, again, for all of you, well done for summing up um, so quickly. We're now on 12 minutes past, so I think we are officially in the informal discussion bit. Uh, thank you. So I, um, I'm aware there are some questions uh, in the chat function that haven't been aired yet. I wonder, um, uh, from Julia, we've had a question saying, how do you factor in the selective nature the individual motivation of open source verification. We've, we've heard very quickly a, res uh, the, a response to Paul's uh, question um, uh, and Lydia had a, a comeback um, on disinformation. Do any of you three want to voice your questions in person because uh, you now can um, just unmute and uh, uh, there's been some short responses um, but feel free to talk if you want to. Nope. <laughs> so I'm going to I'm going to sum up. It feels as though there's some very oh Paul Paul yes. Well, I'll have a go. Um, uh, first of all, I think maybe I I I I had to miss some of this, so this point may be made. Open source may be more useful than uh, its politics to say because open source tick, ticks off state uh, intelligence organisations. So you you get a synergy with what uh, national technical means uh, are picking up and that that all helps the totality of verification but it's generally uncool to mention that um, because it then gets denounced as a, as a tool of spying but um, it does seem to me that this as I tried to suggest this is is important but it really doesn't address the the core problem of managing um, treaties and WMD uh, which is that whatever information you collect it seems that it can be ignored and refuted and denied um, Maria Shap Shap Shaparovna said something very interesting the other day in relation to Syrian chemicals, which was that um, she, of course, rejected the uh, OPCW uh, implementation team and finding, which she went further. She said, in effect, nobody, no organization is entitled to reach any conclusions about attribution or, or um, compliance, except the UN Security Council, where, where we know what Russia's position supported by China is about vetoing any con inconvenient conclusion. So I don't, if, if that, if I'm right, I might be wrong, but if I'm right, that this is the fundamental problem uh, in compliance 
assessment and verification that powerful states simply don't want it to be possible against them or their clients, then I don't know how uh, OSINT makes a fundamental difference or how it ever could with whatever better satellite resolution or information sharing. Uh, so thank you uh, for that, Paul. And it has it echoes all sorts of things that people have raised uh, through uh, the webinar, but also that globally, geopolitically, treaties are encountering problems in verification areas. It seems to me, and I'm going to open it up to everybody else, all the, all the other speakers, um, right here in this webinar, we've got different models about what the point of open source verification is. So Andrea gave a really neat example of how it, it wasn't tied into some big treaty regime for something to happen. Uh, the French journalists collected data and were then able to hold their government to account. Andrea, please correct me if I'm wrong. Likewise, Veronica, it feels, feels to me as though your project is not necessarily about making treaties work. It's about generating information so that other people can do something. <laughs> Whatever that is, it will have a life of its own. I, I can see some nods. So uh, Veronica, do you want to come in first and then Andrea uh, next? Yeah, no, you're totally right. I think you summarized it uh, quite right. We, we're not trying to replace a verification mechanism for any of the official treaties. Rather, we want to empower the decision makers with unbiased uh, analysis of the information that we find in the open source. And with those facts, they can come to the negotiation table and already start those discussions. So again, just to highlight, uh, by no means trying to replace the state level verification. I don't think that's possible with the current capabilities of the open source that are available, but just uh, offering the additional layer to bring facts back to the discussion. Thank you. Um, uh, and, yeah, sorry, Paul. <laughs> I'm just gonna say yes, facts but disputed, inevitably disputed facts. I mean, alternative, maybe true facts, but certainly alternative facts from the point of view of very interested parties in this. But I guess at least to trigger some discussion, uh, even if those facts would be disputed, but we at least start this conversation because sometimes parties to the conflict that they just, they're not able to share the insights that they have because they're not allowed those are, you know, uh, classified information. And here we go, uh, we offer them those insights and say, how about we talk about this? And even if they would start, you know, to say, no, 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 that's not true, that's allegations and whatnot, the discussion is there. And that's where we see our value. Okay, that's, that's a mm -hmm. reasonable expectation. Yes, and I guess it's worth thinking about the counterfactual, Veronica and Paul, maybe if you didn't have empowered conversations based on information that can be demonstrated to have some basis in fact then it would be a worse situation surely but for for those, those sorts of conversations uh thank you andrea um do you have anything to comment because that it feels isn't isn't aiming to be part of these bigger conversations about constructing treaty-based regimes uh no no definitely not uh what we do is actually, I mean, we treat our data in these sense, like as a public good, we provide kind of a resource for a number of different actors. We, we don't charge anyone. I mean, the data are publicly uh, accessible from our website. And so they are used by a variety of actors. Um, I mean, they are used by, surely by governments. But when it comes, you know, there's also a variety uh, of non-governmental actors that uh, have very practical, uh, very practical um, needs to to include these data in their operations. Uh, one of the recent kind of changes we did to our data was actually include kind of sub uh, sub sub event types, which allowed some humanitarians, particularly uh, in uh, in conflict um, conflict uh, warring areas to uh, verify whether you know even some roads were accessible for them uh, whether they were uh, or whether they were instead um, uh, you know marred by either landmines or other forms of fighting the way these data are collected so in real time is of course uh, a, a resource uh, for for many uh, of uh, these organizations that sometimes don't have the resources to either analyze or collect. Uh, and so, you know, uh, 
from, from direct experience and conversations we had with a multitude of um, organizations working in Africa, Asia, or elsewhere, uh, these uh, fitted. Uh, maybe I can add uh, one very um, small comment. Um, I don't think, I mean, the, the data in this sense we, we provide are, uh, I mean, this is a bit more kind of more general reflection, but I'd say uh, they are usually picked up by either journalists or, you know, governments. Uh, they may change, kind of contribute to change the narrative, help some, empower, you know, someone within either in the media or within, you know, government circles or whatever to, 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 to make a change. But I don't think the data themselves like uh, are a resource that will change everything. It's kind of a resource, an additional resource you can use in, you know, uh, for, along with many other things to to push that change. Um, if I'm thinking of, you know, that one of the most frequent use of our data was in relation to the number of uh, fatalities that we had claimed were, were, had died in Yemen, particularly over the past five years, which official figures were saying were up to around 10,000. And we, we, we said based on our data collection, it was 10 times higher at some point. Uh, well, it wasn't that figure that actually helped change kind of the narrative, build somehow like coalitions within some government circles, but it was, it was like those government circles rather picking on our data uh, and then, you know, helping that kind of narrative, challenging what uh, was the narrative within those circles. So I don't know if I kind of answered, but uh, it was a bit on, on the use of the data we, we provide. I think that's really interesting, the really neat uh, uh, idea about a different way that data can be, the, the, the data themselves maybe aren't the only thing that's going on here, um, but from both of you and Veronica, uh, and I'm going to be passing this back to James and Grant and Paul and Lydia, if you want to come in, so, so uh, do be making notes or whatever. Um, so from what I've heard from Veronica and Andrea, there's this sense that good data is important in, in the sense of it could be important in different way but the starting point is to get some good information and check it um, and uh, in a world of disinformation that Lydia's picked up on that there's there's loads of incorrect information out there uh, uh, it's, it's quite important there are checks and balances James pointed out there's nothing new in disinformation um, but there's this sense that maybe there is something new in the scale of it. Uh, Grant was saying that lots of it can be spotted, but there's th th that might not be true. I, I, you know, so, sorry if I get this wrong. But equally, in Veronica and D'Andrea's uh, models, we heard we heard ideas for how that disinformation can be managed to an extent. There's this sense. I think Andrea used the word triangulating the data points. Veronica, you were talking about crowdsourcing, and so a really useful function is perhaps this filtering of of this this soup of information that's out there and Paul's already pointed out you know so what's the point we find this stuff out and how does it tie into bigger points and I and I want to put it to James and Grant and, and anybody else that's interested to comment um, what, um, what bar needs to be hit for, for this to make a really big difference and, and, and it is any bar to an extent completely artificial uh, given uh, what we've heard from Veronica and Andrea about to an extent getting the conversation is enough getting a conversation based on good facts uh, is enough uh, so james and grant I, I don't know if any of that made sense but please feel free <laughs> to come in yeah yeah it did I'm, I'm hoping people can hear me um i i agree with paul's sort of take on on the limits of open source two things i, I would raise that might be worth consideration i mentioned before is this role in alerting people that something has happened so it's most likely that incidents of chemical weapons attacks would likely be identified through, you would first be alerted through social media. Similarly, suspicious disease outbreaks would most likely there will be alerts through things like ProMed, so there's a role there. The other possible role is in relation to um, accountability. Now, I realize that is not the same as treaty compliance and they're distinct and different entities. I'm also aware that the history of prosecuting people for chemical weapons related crimes is not particularly good. But it's possible that they could play with evidence or so open source data being corroborated, authenticated and used as evidence to prosecute crimes. It's a possibility. 
Um, and I think the other factor is <clears throat> this idea that it, it provides additional texture to the picture of the state's compliance or non-compliance, which I think is nonetheless useful. Uh, and, and moving forward, the pendulum may swing back and we may not go back to business as usual, but this is not, it's going to be forever this period of geostrategic tension. So there may be possible possibilities in the future for actually building and accepting some of these tools for use in treaty regimes. But I, I think you're right in terms of the limitations, I, I, it's, it's easy for states to dismiss it. Thank you, James. Um, Grant, did you have anything to add? Um, yeah, I, I've been thinking about Paul's point this whole time, and I mean, I don't have anything significant to add that doesn't like really expand the discussion. Um, I mean, I think there are ways to address Paul's point, but I think it takes us, you know, quite far off topic. Um, but yeah, very, very interesting and, and important. And I, I think that that Paul, you might have missed my talk where I was talking about. But even even getting to the treaty stage in the first place, you might have um, you know strategic release of of disinformation and being able to counter that immediately can be quite helpful as well. Uh, thank you, uh, Grant. Um, Lydia or Paul, do you want to come in with your comments uh, well, in person? Just just for the is, is there a pattern here that in the case we heard about France and French weapons in. Um, Yemen. Uh, I mean, that's, that seems real and true, and, and I can think that British governments have been embarrassed by uh, revelations gathered by journalists or in future by satellite and uh, analysts. But, um, so, but, is, but is, there a, is the underlying pattern there that it's, um, these states are liber mostly liberal democratic in their, in their behavior and their um, accountability? And yeah, it makes a difference to them. Does it make a difference to states which are very determinedly non-liberal democratic and just refused to be held accountable by anyone except their own um, governmental structures? Is that, is that, is that the, the true pattern in the background of this? I mean, Paul, that's certainly where I would take the extended discussion, right? That's the, 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 the lens for you which to answer this, but I think that goes beyond my uh, I mean, I'd have to probably, even for Vertic, say I'm taking my Vertic hat off and start talking. Right, and I think, um, thank you, Grant. I think that's a really interesting point to raise, Paul, and kind of connects back with a question from Julia about the uh, inherent discrimination of the potential for inherent discrimination within open source techniques, in that uh, it's unlikely that everybody all around the world will have equal access to the technologies that are needed to do it, or all the um, political protections maybe that liberal democracies uh, uh, afford. I think that's uh, also debatable, uh, to be honest. Um, uh, we've had an enormously interesting conversation. Um, uh, I, I, as a final point, Lydia, would you like to come in on dis disinformation? Do you feel that the things that you were mentioning have been addressed? It's been really interesting. Thank you very much. I didn't want to um, disrupt it too much, derail the discussion. I just wanted to say that whatever tools that you mentioned to cut, to overcome these um, the disinformation problem, it's the the, the aspects I see as new is that uh, the other actors out there are aware of all of those and are able to match them straight away. So, for example, crowdsourcing. There are tr troll farms pumping it out. So. They've got crowdsourcing on their side, side as well, or, or, or an, a, the manpower to disrupt our um, um, advantages of crowdsourcing, for example, or, or triangulation. You know, they can come up with triangulated sources from one country's conflict quite easily when they're in control there, for example. So that's what I see as a little bit new about disinformation now, is that the speed they can respond, the arms race, of open source information can be can be pretty formidable. Uh, yeah, thank you. Capability, counter capability. For so, sure, for sure. So. We're in a capability counter capability regime. So by that you've you've already alluded to that, Grant, haven't you? About that you are you are mindful of the need to catch up and sometimes you might have the advantage in that relationship and sometimes that move and it might move very very quickly uh, the differential yeah um so um
thank you. I'm going to draw this to a close because we're at the time. Um, I want to thank everybody that's been part of this. The speakers, thank you really for your amazing uh, knowledge and expertise and uh, generosity in responding to the webinar um, invitation. Also to the questions, a really interesting set of questions uh, that we've been able to respond to. Um, uh, we are never going to get distinct set of answers in an hour and a half but I think the questions and exploring the questions are useful uh, in themselves in getting the being the start of a really interesting conversation about the issues the challenges the possibilities that open source verification can afford um, so just to remind you we've recorded this uh, and uh, the recording and the transcript will be available on the SOAS website we have another webinar with a similar theme um, on the 29th of July, which you can see on the SOAS CISD page. Um, and thank you again very much. I hope to see you soon. Yeah, bye-bye. Thank you. Thanks. Bye. Thank you so much. Bye. Bye. Really nice to see you all.